Hi everyone, welcome back to Art of the Part. In this video, we're going to continue on with our business card holder case study, and we're going to start to look at program optimization to try to bring down the total cycle time of some of our toolpaths. So this is going to build off the last video that we did, which was an introduction to five-axis programming using indexing or swivel rotations, or in our instance, cycle 800s, where we rotated the table in five-axis, locked it at a specific angle, and then took a cut. So this is in contrast to typical three-axis milling where we would have to use a ball mill and surface out these angles pass by pass, which would take quite a bit of time. So even though that we can utilize the five-axis swivel rotations here, if I click on my toolpath group and I click on verify, we're still sitting at about 27 or 28 minutes. And I'll look here at my cycle time here. Yeah, 27 minutes. And with my experience in this part, I would really like to see this come down to about 15 or 16 minutes. So we're going to have to look through some of these toolpaths here and identify the ones that are taking a little bit too much time, maybe approach those with some different techniques to try to bring those cycle times down. Additionally, we want to start to look at our toolpath operations and see if we can organize them in such a way so that we prioritize tool changes or swivel rotations. So that means do we want to pull out a tool and do we want to finish as much as we can on the part using that tool no matter how many swivel rotations are needed or do we want to rotate the table and finish that specific face no matter how many tools or tool changes are needed. So we favored the swivel rotation in the last video because I thought that was the easiest way for us to understand five axis programming using indexing because we would just rotate to a face and then finish everything that we needed on that face. However, there's a considerable amount of time that's going to be associated with each tool change or swivel rotation because the tool has to return back to the home position and then rotate out and pull out a new tool or return back to the uh, home position and then rotate and then come back into the part. So we're really not going to see that time added up in Mastercam because Verify is just reading each one of those tool changes or swivel rotations at 100% feed rate. So I actually created two different programs using the exact same toolpath, just organized a little bit differently to see which one would run faster. Would it be the tool change prioritization or would it be the swivel rotation prioritization? Now I ran and recorded each of those programs on our machine. I'm going to show that to you here at the end of this video so that we can take a look at the time studies and see which one is truly best. But before we do that, let's take a step back and look at these other toolpaths to see which ones can be improved or reduced in time before we begin to reorganize them. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I want to do is I want to select my entire toolpath group here from the left hand side in my operations manager and then run that and verify to see if there's any information that I can pick up. So I'm going to select on that toolpath group one and then click on verify and this is going to open up that verify simulation window. Now verify does a pretty good job of telling us what the total runtime is going to be. So 27 minutes, 21 seconds, as well as the total elapsed runtime that's going to incur as soon as I hit the play button. So if I click on play, and you look up here in the top right hand corner, we're going to see that uh, lapse time begin to add up. However, this is going to be difficult for us to decipher which toolpath operation is which because they're all running in yellow. So what we're going to need to do is up here in the top left hand corner in that top ribbon bar, we're going to find the verify tab and inside of verify, we're going to find that color loop option. So we're going to turn on color loop and this is going to separate each one of those toolpath operations into their own colors. Likewise, we can see that timeline down here at the bottom get updated with those colors as well. However, this can be a little bit deceiving because it's not a true accurate one-to-one -one representation of the length of time that each one of those toolpath operations are going to run in relation to the entire program. More or less, this is just telling us that the length of this color loop is just the number of lines of code that are associated to that operation as it relates to the entire length of the program. However, I still think that this is an incredibly useful tool in identifying which one of these toolpath operations are probably going to be taking the longest amount of time to complete. So that's going to be that blue color loop option as well as that yellow color loop option. Now we could back out of verify and select those toolpath operations individually and then run them so we can see the total length of time. But I think that's going to be a lot of back and forth. So there's an easier way to do that and we're just going to have to back out of Verify and use Backplot instead. So I'm going to click out of Verify and get back to this screen. Now before we use Backplot, I just want to make sure that we have our entire toolpath group still selected. So over on the left hand side in the Operations Manager, select our toolpath group 1 and make sure that there is a check mark next to each one of these operations. And then I want you to come up here to Verify and then to the left of it there's an icon with four blue waves that's called Backplot. So we're going to select on Backplot and it's going to open up this simulation right here. Now Backplot is going to operate a little bit differently than Verify in that we won't be opening up a separate window and we won't be able to see the removal of material. However, if I click the play button up here, I can actually see my tools travel along their toolpath geometry. 
And while that's useful, I really don't need to utilize that right now. So I'm going to click the stop right here and then rewind it so it gets rid of that toolpath geometry. And I'm going to utilize this backplot window and I'm going to hit the two blue arrows pointing down to expand it out. So once it's expanded, I can see my entire toolpath group one. And that's why we wanted to make sure that the entire toolpath was selected because if I only select one operation, I'm only see one operation in this window. So if I click on toolpath group one and I select it and everything is highlighted, and I come over here to the information tab, I can actually expand this out a little bit. I can see that I have a total runtime of 27 minutes and 16 seconds. So just a little bit different than the verify we were looking at earlier. I think that was 27 minutes and 21 seconds. But the advantage here is that I can click on individual toolpaths and I can see how long they're gonna run. So if I click on that uh, 5 8 end mill third cycle 800 pocket roughing, I see that it's around 29 seconds. And if I come down here to this one, one minute, keep scrolling down, eight minutes and 13 seconds. So I know that that was going to be the blue color loop that we were looking at earlier, and that the toolpath right after it, the yellow color loop, is gonna be taking up quite a bit of time as well. So I'm gonna click on this toolpath right underneath it, and that's gonna be 15 minutes and 53 seconds. So between these two toolpaths, it's taking up the bulk of the entire program, if I click on that toolpath, hold down the control key, and I select them both, I can actually see that it's 21 minutes and 21 seconds out of the entire 27 minutes and however many seconds program. That's like 75% of the entire program just dedicated to those two toolpaths. So you can see that we can use Verify to identify what toolpaths are probably going to be problems, and then we can use Backplot to isolate those toolpaths and see what they're going to run in individual cycle times. So I'm going to focus on these two toolpaths here at the bottom of my program. It's going to be this 2D dynamic mill for the 250 end mill, as well as the 2D dynamic mill for this 312 end mill. And I think that's going to be these two right there. So I'm going to back out a back plot. I'm going to start focusing on those two toolpaths. So the first toolpath that I want to take a look at here is that 10th toolpath operation, which is going to be a 2D dynamic mill using a 250 end mill for the fourth cycle 800 pocket. So if I click on that 10th toolpath operation, I can see my toolpath is isolated for that front pocket there. And I'm going to expand this out and take a look at my parameters. So I'll notice that I'm using a 250 end mill, and I might want to utilize the same milling strategy that I talked about in the last video, where I rough out a pocket with a bigger tool, I leave like five thousandths on the floor and the walls, and then I come back with a finishing operation with a smaller tool and then clean up those corners and all those edges. So I might want to change this from a 250 end mill to a 312 end mill, but I'll come back to that here in just a second. I'm going to jump down here to the depth of cuts. I'm going to see that my rough step here is 0.125 or 1 8th. So that means that each step that I'm going down is a value of 0.125. And then I'll go to my linking parameters and I'll see how far I'm going down. And my total depth is going to be 0.375 or 3 8 And right now, if I take 3 8 divided by 1 8th or 0.375 divided by 0.125, I get a value of three total passes. And I want to see if I can try to cut that down to two passes uh, to try to make up some time here. So I'm going to jump up here to my tool and I'm going to change that from that 250 m mil to that 312 m mil. And when I change my tool, I just want to make sure that I right click on that tool and then I reinitialize the feeds and speeds so that it updates those values. Likewise, I'm going to update my note here, and I'm going to change this from 0.25 nml to 0.312 nml, and then I'm just going to add a note here for rough. I'm also going to jump down here to my cut parameters, and I'm going to make sure that I leave some stock in the walls and the floors. So I'm going to put a value of 0 0.005, or 5 thousandths, in both of those fields. I'll jump down here to my depth of cuts, and like I said, I wanted to try to get my um, total passes down from 3 to 2. I'm going to let Mastercam do the math here for me. So instead of 0.125, I'm going to change this to 0.375, so that's my total depth, divided by 2, which is going to be 2 total passes, and then hit enter. I'm going to get a value there of 0.1875, or 3 sixteenths. And then I'll jump down here to my linking parameters and just make sure that all my values are still correct. And then I'll hit the green check mark. All right, so it looks like our toolpath did update. However, the adjustments that we made have now negatively affected our toolpath cutting strategy. So before we were using that 2D dynamic mill where it was a bunch of radiuses overlapping each other. And now it's just updated to be a ramp all the way down to the bottom, which is not exactly what I want for this pocket. 
So what I'm gonna to need to do is actually update the entry motion because we're now using a bigger tool and we're trying to squeeze it into a smaller pocket. So I'm gonna jump over here to my parameters and I'm gonna go down here to entry motion and instead of this value where it says 0.140625, I'm just gonna divide that by two and that value comes around to be 0 0.0703125 and you can round it to like 0 0.075 if you want but all we're doing is we're trying to change the size of that helix radius so that it can squeeze inside of the extents of that pocket. So I'm going to hit the green check mark and see if this updates back to what we were looking at before with our milling strategy. And take a look at that. That's exactly what we want to see. We've gotten back to those overlapping radii going from one edge of the pocket to the other. And we're utilizing that same exact milling strategy from four, but now we're using a bigger tool and we're doing it in less passes going from three to two. So let's see if those adjustments have brought down our cycle time any. So I'm gonna click on our 10th toolpath operation and I'm gonna go back up here to that back plot. And inside a back plot, I'm just gonna select that 2D dynamic mill and I'm gonna go over here to that information tab. And I'm gonna see that we've gone from eight minutes and 13 seconds using a 250 end mill in three passes down to four minutes and 30 seconds using a 312 end mill doing two passes. So that's a pretty good improvement. And I think we can take this one step further by utilizing a technique called high speed milling, which is very advantageous whenever we're using dynamic mill. So I'm gonna hit the green check mark and then jump back here into parameters. Now, high speed milling or HSM can only be utilized in certain applications like dynamic mill because we can control certain values like step over percentage and minimum toolpath radius. And I wanna make mention that high speed milling is completely dependent on your tool and tool holder assembly. So you make sure you look into that before you make these changes. But I'm gonna jump up here into my tool tab and I can see that I'm using my 312 end mill. If I double click on that, it's gonna open up this window and I can see some values. So I have an overall length, which is the amount that the tool is sticking out past the tool holder. So that value is one and a half inches. That's important for me to remember. And then I'm gonna jump down here to my finalized property tab and I can see some other values, like the number of teeth that are associated with my tool. So I have three flutes on this specific tool. Likewise, it's sitting at 6,000 RPM, and then we have a feed rate of 18 inches per minute. And those values are based on my experience and just cutting slots, but we're using dynamic mill, so we're doing a little bit of a cut, and then we're coming back, a little bit of a cut, coming back, and repeating that. So I really think that we can crank these values up but we have to do a little bit of math. And the easiest way to do that math, I think, is to utilize a website or an app called FS Wizard. So I'm gonna back out of this window, and we can also change those values here and here, but we're gonna open up our browser, so I'm gonna look at Google Chrome, and then up here in the search bar, I'm gonna type FS Wizard. So that's the letter F, the letter S, and then Wizard. And then I'll hit Enter, and then I'm gonna look for this link right here, FS Wizard, Speeds and Feeds and it's gonna open up this page and then we can start changing some of these values to see what we can increase the spindle speed and the feed rate to. Now you can see here that there are some values left over that I've done from previous calculations, so this might not look exactly the same as yours. However, I wanted to walk through this together so you can at least see how it's done. The first thing that I wanna do is establish the material type that we're using. So there should be a menu up here. If we click on it, it's a drop down. It's gonna give us a list of material. And this is going to look a lot like the Samvic website that we've been using in the past. So there's color codes for like ferrous and non-ferrous materials. So we're just gonna scroll down here and find the light green color for non-ferrous. And we're gonna find 6061 T6 aluminum. And you can see that there's a hardness Brunel rating for each one of these material types. So for 6061 T6 aluminum, we have a 95 hardness Brunel. So if I click on that, it's gonna lock that material into place. And again, this might not look exactly the same on your side, but there's these little tabs here. If we click on them, they're gonna expand out. And I'm just gonna give some data for our cutting tool. So the tool type that we're using, if we hit this drop down menu, um, we're gonna find that solid end mill. And typically with high speed milling, you are gonna use a solid end mill, but you do have other options. But in most cases, we're gonna utilize that solid end mill because there's more rigidity in it. The tool material that we're gonna be using is if we hit that drop down, carbide. So we're using a solid carbide end mill. There is no coating on this specific tool that we're using. The units of measurement that we're in is inches and the tool diameter is 5 16 or a value of 0.3125. The number of flutes, and these are all values that we can get from the uh, master cam window when we open up the tool. So we have three flutes on this specific tool. The tool is sticking out a value of 0.1, or sorry, 1.5, so one and a half inches. No corner radius, no ball nose. Uh, flute length, we have to increase this to 0.75 or three quarters. 
Uh, helix angle, we can leave that the same as 30, lead angle 90, shank diameter, in this instance is gonna match our tool diameter, which is that 5 16ths or 0 0.3125. And then once we have everything filled out here, we have to open up this next tab. So the one below it, engagement DOC or engagement depth of cut. So I click on that, it's gonna expand out. The depth of cut, if you remember, we changed it from 125 or 1 8 and we're gonna increase it. So we went from three passes to two passes to 0.1875 or 3 16ths. So I'm gonna give a value here of 0.1875. The width of cut, um, we aren't gonna to try to figure this one out. I'm gonna let the program figure this one out for us because if you go back into our cutting parameters, we can establish the uh, step over percentage when we're in a dynamic mill. So in this instance, our step over percentage was actually 25%. So when I type in 25%, it's gonna calculate that out for me and it's gonna give me a value of 78 thousandths. So that means that when the tool is cutting, it's gonna take away 78 thousandths and then it's gonna come back and then take another 78 thousandths and then come back and it's gonna repeat that. So that's the advantage of that dynamic mill. Now you wanna make sure that your slotting is turned off because if you do turn that on, it's gonna default here to 100% with a cut. And I think that just defeats the purpose of us using dynamic mill. So I'm gonna turn that off and then change this back here to 25%. Likewise, uh, I do not want to activate chip thinning because we're already calculating it out using dynamic mill in combination with high speed milling. So this would just be more or less redundant. I do want to turn on my HSM or my high speed milling. And then once you have all these fields filled out, you can see that there's a recommended speeds and feeds up here in this top loop bar. So before we were sitting at 6,000 RPM with an 18 inches per minute feed rate, and we've now increased that to 10,000 RPM and a feed rate of 103 inches per minute. So that's a big jump, but we're allowed to do that because we can control the width of cut now. So we're only going 25% in with that step over percentage. And this is all dependent on your tool and tool holder assembly. And I think personally, our tool is just sticking out a little bit too much, but I did want the length of cut for other projects. So I'm not gonna change this for just this one specific detail. But ideally, I would probably change this width of cut here to like 10%. And I would change my depth of cut to the full depth of that pocket. So I would go to 0.375. And you can see that the recommended speeds and feeds are exactly the same as they were before. Um, but when I tried this on our machine, I was just hearing a little bit too much chatter. So I decreased the depth of cut here back down to, you know, half or 0.1875. And I changed my width of cut over to 25%. And this just gave me a better uh, cutting operation and less chatter. I still heard a little bit. And again, these are recommended values, so you can change them. And I just dropped our feed rate down from 103 to 90. And that was a very good sweet spot for us when we were cutting that detail. And just take this with a grain of salt because you do not have to use these values exactly as they are. They're just a great starting point for you to reference when you start to enter into high speed milling. So now I'm gonna plug these values in the master cam and see what my cycle time ends up being. So I'm gonna minimize out of my browser and then come here into master cam and you can see my parameters window is still open from before. So we were looking at that 10th tool path which is the fourth cycle 800 pocket and we have our speeds and feeds right down here. So we were sitting at about 6,000 RPM. Our feed rate was 18 inches per minute, and that was calculating our feed per tooth about 1,000. So if I update these values with what we were looking at in FS Wizard, let's see what this calculates out to be. So I'm gonna change my spindle speed here to 10,000 RPM. I'm gonna increase my feed rate to 90 inches per minute. So we're just going a little bit below the recommended value because I was hearing some chatter. And that's gonna calculate the feed for tooth to three thousandths. So going from one thousandths to three thousandths, we're pushing our tool about three times faster. However, that's totally fine since we're using 2D dynamic mill in combination with that high speed, high speed milling strategy. Likewise, we're just trying to rough that pocket out. So we're trying to remove as much material as quickly as we can. We're leaving five thousandths on the wall as well as the floor. And we'll just clean that pocket out later with a, a slower tool path. So I'll hit the green check mark and let this regenerate. And we're just gonna investigate this here in the back plot. So just make sure that you have the 10th toolpath operation selected. So that's gonna be our fourth cycle 800 pocket. And I'm going to select my back plot option here. It's gonna open up this window. I'll select that 2D dynamic mill from the window. And inside that information tab, I can see the total runtime sitting at about 59 seconds. So that is a massive improvement from what we were looking at earlier. Originally, we were sitting with the 250 end mill going about 125 deep, and that was coming out around, what, like eight minutes and 13 seconds. And then we updated it to the roughing operation with the 312 end mill going about 187 deep. So we went from three passes down to two passes, and that brought that down to about four minutes and 30 seconds. So using that same exact tool, 
in the same exact depth of cut, we're just going to push that uh, speeds and feeds a little bit more. And we're seeing it come down from 4 minutes and 30 seconds all the way down here to almost 1 minute exactly on the mark. So that is awesome. That is a massive improvement. And we're able to take about 7 minutes out of that uh, entire program just for this one specific pocket. And we're going to use the exact same milling strategy and parameters on that front slot because that was sitting at about 16 minutes. So I'm going to say that's pretty good and we can go ahead and move on into the next toolpath operation which is going to be that slot for the card holder in the front of the part. So I'm going to back out of this uh, back plot window. I'm going to click on my 11th toolpath operation. And while it's selected, I'm just going to shift my part up so I can see the toolpath geometry. And it looks like I have about one, two, three, four, five tool passes. And I'd probably like to see that number come down, especially if you're using that dynamic mill. And let's go ahead and just check what the time study is um, while we have this uh, toolpath operation selected. So make sure that you have the check mark next to 11. And then we'll click on back plot and we'll click on the toolpath operation here in that window. And inside of information, we can see that the total runtime is about 15 minutes and 54 seconds. So using those same values that we were using from FS Wizard, let's see if we can bring that down to a more manageable amount. So I'm going to back out a back plot here. I'm going to expand my 11th toolpath. We'll click on parameters. And we're going to get into that parameter window. And we can see that we're still using the same speeds and feeds from before. So 6,000 RPM, 18 inches per minute, and then our feed per tooth was about 1,000. So we're going to update that to 10,000 RPM. We're going to change the feed rate here to 90 inches per minute. And that should calculate the feed per tooth out to about 3 thousandths. We'll also add a note here for rough. We'll change this to a roughing operation. We'll come back with another operation and actually finish that out with a better surface finish. And then we'll come down here to cut parameters. So again, we're changing this to a roughing operation. So I'm going to leave 5 thousandths on the walls as well as the floor. We can see that the step over percentage is 25%. So that matches the values that we were putting in FS Wizard. We'll come down here to depth of cuts and the max rough of step. We're just going to update that to be 0.1875. Linking parameters, this all looks good. Entry motion, um, we might have to come back and change this value. However, the toolpath is already generated, so I don't think we need to divide this by two like we did before. So let's hit the green check mark and see if this regenerates. Looks like everything's good. We've gotten this down to one, two, three, four tool passes. So I'm pretty happy with that. So let's check this out in back plot. So I'm going to select that 11th toolpath there. We'll click on the back plot. And then we'll click on that toolpath operation there in the window. And inside of information, whew, we got 355 hours, 18 minutes, and 17 seconds. That's not exactly what I wanted to see, but this is an error that happens sometimes. I think it's just a glitch that is in 2023. But I'll hit the green check mark. Um, and then we're going to jump back here into the parameters of that 11th toolpath. And this happens sometimes when you're changing your speeds and feeds using dynamic mill. But if you come up here to the cut parameters, you can see this back feed rate went down to half a tenth. So that's just like the minimum value. Sometimes it defaults back down to that minimum value when you're changing your speeds and feeds. So I'm just going to update this to 100. And all that means is it's just allowing you to control that back feed rate. So you're taking a cut, coming back, taking a cut, coming back, taking a cut, coming back. So that back feed rate is this value right here. So I'm just giving a back feed rate of 100. I'll hit the green check mark. I'll let that regenerate. While I still have that 11th toolpath selected, I'll click on the back plot once again. I'll click on that toolpath operation in the window. Inside of information, we're back down to a more manageable amount, 3 minutes and 53 seconds. So that's more along the lines of what I wanted to see, not that 355 hour amount. So if you ever see that jump up into those hundreds of hours, just go back into your cutting parameters and just check your back feed rate there. So now I'm going to back out a back plot for this specific tool operation. And I want to look at the entire toolpath group and check the total runtime with all the changes that we made. So I can back out a back plot by either hitting the green check mark or the X up here. But I just want to get back here to my uh, operations manager. So I'm going to select my entire toolpath group one so all of my toolpath operations get selected. There should be a check mark next to each one of these. And then I'll select back plot once again. Inside this window, I'll select my toolpath group 1 so all of these get highlighted, and then I'll jump over here to my information tab. So we see a total runtime of 6 minutes and 58 seconds. So that is a massive improvement from what we were looking at earlier where it was like 26 or 27 minutes. And when we singled out this front pocket here for the 4th cycle 800 as well as this uh, slot here for the card holder, both of those together, that was just 21 minutes. 
So utilizing dynamic mill with high speed milling techniques, we're able to bring this down considerably. And the only reason that we're not seeing this at like that 15 or 16 minute mark that we were talking about earlier is because we're not seeing the text. We need to include that as well as some finishing operations. But this is also not including the uh, swivel rotations or the tool changes. So it's just reading both of those at 100% feed rate. And we're really not seeing a true time associated to those values. So I just want to check this here and verify as well. But we have a, a value here of 6 minutes and, and 58 seconds. But if I click uh, the green check mark, select my toolpath group one, come here and verify. We can also see that the uh, total runtime here is like seven minutes even. So we're seeing a you know one-to-one -one relationship between that back plot and this verify here. They're not exact, but they're, they're pretty darn close. Um, so I'm gonna back out of verify here and we can start looking at our toolpath operations in such a way that we can reorder them so that we favor tool changes rather than swivel rotations. So let's go ahead and start with that. So now might be a pretty good time for us to save out a couple copies, one for tool changes and then one for swivel rotations because we're about to make some adjustments to our toolpath group and I don't want you to lose your progress one way or the other. Now the file that we're currently looking at and the video that I did on introduction to five axis programming using indexing was all based on swivel rotation prioritization. So we rotate the table, we lock it at a specific angle and then we try to finish that face no matter how many tool changes were needed. So now I'm gonna to start to reorder my toolpath group in such a way that I favor tool changes instead of swivel rotations. So that means I'm gonna pull out a tool and I'm gonna to try to finish as much as I can on the part no matter how many swivel rotations are needed. So now I'm gonna look at our toolpath group and organize it so that each operation that's using the same tool is next to each other. Now there's a handful of ways that we can go about doing this, but I think the easiest way for us is just to reference the notes that we've been leaving for ourselves while we set up each toolpath operation. So if I look over here on the left hand side, I can see my first toolpath operation is a facing operation and it's using the three inch face mill. And the toolpath below it is a 5 8 M mill with the first cycle at 100 and the toolpath below that is a half inch drill, first cycle at 100 and so on and so forth. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to look for the next instance that we have a three inch face mill and I'm gonna to try to group that together with the three inch face mill in that first toolpath operation. So I'm gonna come down here to my sixth toolpath operation. It's another facing operation, and I see that it's using the three inch face mill for the third cycle 800. Now it doesn't matter that it's on a different swivel rotation. All I'm gonna do is I just wanna make sure that I have it highlighted or selected and that there's a check mark next to it. And when I click and hold on it, I can drag it up here to the first uh, toolpath operation. So I'm gonna uh, release my mouse button so it drops, and then I have the option to either move it before or after. So I'm gonna to choose to move it after, and now I have my two three inch face mill operations next to each other. So now when it moves from the first toolpath operation to the second toolpath operation, it's not gonna to try to kick a tool change. So now I'm gonna repeat that process with each one of my tools to try to get them grouped together, and then I'll regenerate and check it out and verify. Now I'm gonna work my way down from biggest to smallest tool. We got our two three inch face mills together, and the next biggest tool is gonna be that 5 8 end mill. And we're just gonna keep scanning down this entire toolpath group until we see another instance of that 5 8 mil. It looks like our fifth toolpath operation is gonna be the 5 8 mil for the second cycle 800 face. I'm gonna make sure that I select on that and there's a check mark next to that one and that one only. I'm gonna click hold and I'm gonna drag that and drop that right on top of my third toolpath operation. And I'm gonna to choose to move after. And again, I'm just gonna keep working my way down, look for the next instance of that 5 8 10 mil. Looks like I have a seventh toolpath operation, which is going to be for the third cycle 800 pocket roughing. Click hold, I'm gonna drag that, and I'm gonna drop that on the fourth uh, toolpath operation. Choose to move after, keep working our way down here. We're looking for the ninth toolpath operation, which is gonna be a 5 8 10 mil, fourth cycle 800 face. Click hold, and we're gonna drag that and drop that right underneath the uh, fifth toolpath operation. So we'll choose to move after there. And then there should be one more instance. Looks like the 12th toolpath here, the fifth cycle 800 face. We'll click hold and we'll drag that and we'll drop that right on top of that sixth toolpath operation and then choose to move after. And my preference here is to try to group together all of my end mills and then I'll do the drilling last. So I'm gonna skip the half inch drill right now, but I'm gonna go to the 312 end mill or the 516th end mill here. And if I go and try to find that, looks like it's my 11th toolpath. It's gonna to be that fourth cycle 800 pocket rough. Click on that, hold and drag. And I'll drop that right after the last instance of the 5 8 mill. So after the seventh toolpath operation, choose to move after. 
And then there's another instance here of the 312M mill, which is the 12 toolpath operation. Click hold and we'll just drag that right after the uh, eighth toolpath operation. So my two 312M mills are together. And then once again, I'm just gonna have to find my last end mill here, which is going to be my 1 8 end mill. So it's my 12 toolpath operation. Click hold and I'll just drag that and drop that right after my uh, 312 end mill here. And I'll choose to move after. So now I have, and I'll just minimize these two here, I have my two 3-inch face mills together, I have my 5 5 8 end mills together, I have my two uh, 312 end mills together, I have my 1 1 8 end mill together, and I have my two uh, half-inch drills together. So I'll select my entire toolpath group 1 here, and I'll choose to regenerate it, which is going to be this little tool with a green play button right after it. I'll let that regenerate. And then while we still have our toolpath group one selected, I will choose to verify and see what this looks like. All right, so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. I'm gonna shift this over. And then I'm gonna slow this down so I can talk about it while we're going through it. But I'll play this out. And you can see there we have our first uh, three inch face mill, which is gonna face off the top there in yellow. And instead of moving into the first cycle 800, which is gonna be that face there on the left, we're actually going to move into the third cycle 800, which is still using the three inch face mill, but it's going to be there in blue. And now we're done with our three inch face mills. We're going to pull out our 5 8 end mill, and we're going to start looking at that first cycle 800. And instead of trying to finish up that face there and pulling out the half inch drill and plunging that hole, it's just going to rotate and move over and try to finish up this uh, second cycle 800. So I'll let that play out. You can see that it's just moving on to whatever is next for the 5 8 end mill. So now we're moving on to that uh, pocket here. We're just roughing it out. I'll speed this up a little bit. And as we're getting to the end of that roughing operation, we're actually going to move into these faces rather than trying to finish up this pocket. So see that here, probably one or two more passes of that corner. And then it's going to transition into that front face there in teal and then the back face there uh, for the nameplate. So now we're done with our 5 8 end mills. We're gonna be using the 312 end mill now. And this is the dynamic pockets that we were looking at earlier with the high-speed milling. So I'll speed that up and get through them. And then after that, we should be coming up on the 1 8 end mill, which is going to be cleaning up the corners of that pink pocket there. So it looks like we're just cleaning up those corners. And then we'll finish up with the two drills here on the first cycle 800 and then the second cycle 800. So I'm pretty happy with how that's getting optimized to prioritize tool changes over swivel rotations. Uh, we can see here we have a total runtime of 6 minutes and 59 seconds, so matching what we were seeing in backplot earlier as well. However, this still isn't the total runtime because as I mentioned before, we should really see this sit around 15 or 16 minutes with that final program. So this part doesn't include the text here at the center of the pocket. It doesn't include the text there at the front of the face for the name. We don't have any finishing operations for this pocket right here or that slot right there. And then we still have some deburring to consider for these sharp edges in these pockets. So once we start to include those toolpath operations, we'll probably start to see that total runtime increase. However, this number will still be skewed because when we go from master cam to machine, master cam really doesn't account for tool changes or swivel rotations. So I have two finished programs, one for the swivel rotations and then one for the tool changes. And we can take a look at that here in Mastercam and see what their verify numbers are and then compare them against what we got at the machine to see what those discrepancies truly are. All right, so I have a couple of my finished programs opened up here in Mastercam. And you can see the part that's here in red, this is going to be our swivel rotation prioritization file. And then I have another window opened up here in the background and you can see that the part is green. This is going to be for our tool change prioritization. And just a reminder, these two programs have the exact same tool paths, they're just ordered a little bit differently. So I'm gonna jump back here to my swivel uh, rotation prioritization. And you can see here in my toolpath group, I've added a couple more toolpaths for finishing as well as text and then deburring. And I just wanna talk about those before we look at verify. So the center pocket here, we're still using that 5 8 end mill to rough this out. We're leaving about five thousandths on the floor as well as the walls. And then we would go and use the 1 8 end mill to clean out these corners. But I'm going to use another uh, tool here, which is going to be the 250 end mill, to clean that out because I want to push it a little bit faster. And once again, I'm leaving about five thousandths on the floor and the walls. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to do one complete finish operation on that 
uh, pocket there with the 1 8 end mill. So you can see that I have a pretty healthy step over percentage and then once I get to the walls I actually slow that down and then add more passes so I have a better surface finish. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want a nice smooth finish across that entire pocket. I don't want any blending issues going from the 5 8 end mill to the 1 8 end mill because there might be some wear and tear between those two different tools. And then I'm going to continue to walk down here. You can see I have an engraving here for the Made in Chicago, Illinois Tech, and then INTM 439-539. Continuing down, I have my high-speed milling pocket that we were looking at for uh, that front slot. And then um, instead of using the 312 end mill to try to finish this out, we do have uh, 135 radii in these corners. So I have to use a smaller tool than that 312, so I have to use a 250 end mill to clean that up. So once again, just doing a final pass at the floor and the walls, uh, just with that 250 end mill. Okay, continuing to walk down, and then you can see here uh, that front detail. I could technically cut this with the front of the tool or the flat end of the tool. However, I'll show you here in back plot. Um, I'm actually trying to do like a swarfing operation where I'm cutting with the side of the tool. I just think that's a little bit better. I wanted to try that out. And um, it's just preventing me from having to rotate the table like this and then take the tool and cut it with the face of it and do multiple passes. Instead, I'm just rotating like this and then I'm cutting it with the side of the tool and that's just one pass. So pretty happy with that. And I'll X out a back plot. And then here's that uh, dynamic mill for that slot. So we're using that 312 end mill. Uh, we did it in four passes. And then I just added one additional pass here for a contour operation uh, to finish out the floor as well as the walls. Uh, you can see there's some text there at the front for that uh, nameplate. And then we added a deburring operation. And I actually used the uh, five axis deburring uh, toolpath, which I thought was pretty useful so I could keep it all in one uh, toolpath operation. So I'll select my entire toolpath group here, and then I'll run that here and verify and see what the total runtime is. So this is adding up to be about 11 minutes and 24 seconds, and then I'll let this play out. If you wanted to, you could count out the number of tool changes as well as swivel rotations, but I'll just tell you right now, looking at the swivel rotation prioritization program, we have a total of 15 tool changes and then eight swivel rotations. So in total, we have 23 operations that the master cam isn't actually accounting for. It's just running that at 100% feed rate. So now I'm going to take a look at my tool change prioritization file. So I'll jump down here into my windows and I'll look at the green part file here. And again, you can see that the number of tool paths are exactly the same. I've just ordered them a little bit differently. So I grouped together my 3 inch face mills. I have my 5 8 end mills all together, uh, my 3 12 end mills all together, 250 end mills. I have one 1 8 end mill to finish out that pocket there. And then I have two half inch drills. And then these uh, deburring as well as my contouring, these are all using the same tools. So it's a 1 8 uh, ball mill. And then for the text here, I'm just plunging that down about like two and a half thousand so I can get the spacing right between the letters. So I'll select my entire toolpath group here and I'll run this and verify and see what this calculates out to be. Uh, total runtime is, once again, 11 minutes and 24 seconds. So between the tool change prioritization and then the swivel rotation prioritization, they're both reading the exact same time here in Verify. So it's really not accounting for those tool changes or those swivel rotations. So I'll let this play out. And again, you can count it if you'd like. But looking at the tool change prioritization file, we have a total number of seven uh, tool changes as well as 13 swivel rotations. So again, all things be equal, we have 20 operations here in the tool change prioritization file and then 23 operations in the swivel rotation file. So if I'm looking at the raw data between those two, I think that the tool change prioritization file is actually gonna run a little bit faster because we have three less uh, rotations or tool changes that need to be included. And I can take a look here at the videos that I recorded for both these programs. So here are some files that I brought from the machine. You can see here I got two videos, one for swivel prioritization and then one for the tool change prioritization, as well as two screenshots that I pulled from the controller at the end of each program to see what their total runtime is. And something to keep in mind with these two videos is that they're time lapses, so they're the entire length of the program, they're just compressed down to about like 30 or 40 seconds. So we'll look at the swivel prioritization uh, video first and then I'll talk about it while it's playing. So I'll let this play out. And again, with swivel rotation, we're just trying to rotate the table and then finish everything with that specific face or angle, no matter how many tool changes are needed. So we're doing that center pocket there. 
and then this is now going to be the uh, front slot so it's the 312 high speed mill and then we're going to change that out for the 250 mm mill finish that out then we're doing the uh, two faces here with the uh, drills and then we're going to come to that uh, slot there for the card holder this is going to be that 312 dynamic mill coming through there and then we'll do one finishing pass with that contour and then this is going to be all the deburring as well as the uh, text so altogether that time lapse took about 39 seconds and just keep that in mind when we look at the next time lapse for the tool change prioritization so I'm going to back out of this one and then I'm going to look at my tool change prioritization video and again, before we look at this video, I just want to make mention that when we're looking at tool change prioritization, we're trying to reduce the number of tool changes at the expense of swivel rotations. So we'll probably see this rotate out a little bit more, but we're trying to finish as much as we can with that specific tool before moving on to the next tool. So I'll again play this out and talk about it while it's going through, but we're going to start this program out with the two three inch face mills, and then we're going to finish out these faces with that 5 8 end mill. And then we're going to come here and rough this slot out with that 312 end mill, and that's going to be that 2D dynamic mill. And we're going to go down four passes, then we'll come to the bottom, and then we'll uh, clean up that bottom face and all the walls. And using that same 312 end mill, we're going to rotate to this face and rough out this pocket, pull out the 250 end mill, clean up those corners, come back to that center pocket, clean up the corners again, and then use the 1 8 end mill to finish that entire face, two drills. And then that's going to be that 1 8 ball mill, which is going to... Uh, deburr all those edges as well as cut the text. So all together with that tool change prioritization, uh, we're seeing the time lapse sit there about 34 seconds. And just looking at the time lapse alone, going from tool change prioritization to swivel prioritization, we're seeing a difference of five seconds while it's sped up at this speed. So I really think that this tool change prioritization uh, program is going to be the better option for us. So I'll back out of this video and we can take a look at these two screenshots here, but looking at the swivel prioritization uh, screenshot. And we can see here that the total runtime on that program is sitting at 18 minutes and 49 seconds. So again, that's a huge difference from what we were seeing in Mastercam and Verify, which was at 11 minutes and 24 seconds. So all those swivel rotations and tool changes are not being added up or accounted for in the Verify. It's just reading them at 100% feed rate and then moving on to the next toolpath operation. So big difference from you know virtual to reality. And then I'm going to go over here to the tool change prioritization screenshot and we can see that's down here to 16 minutes and 45 seconds. So the difference between the swivel and the tool, we have a total of two minutes difference there. And that's a big difference using the exact same toolpath, just ordered a little bit differently. And that might not seem like a lot on one part, but if we're looking at making like 100 or 200 or 1,000 parts, that time is really going to start to add up. So it's going to be important for us to start looking at this in such a way that we optimize our toolpaths before we start to export them out. Now, I hope that you can see that there's some method in my madness in going through all these steps. And there's going to be certain applications where using swivel prioritization is going to be more beneficial to your part or program over tool change prioritization. However, looking at the business card holder case study, we can clearly see that the tool change prioritization program is the more beneficial option for us. It reduced the cycle time by a whole two minutes. Likewise, we can see that there's a big difference between the virtual and the actual. So when we were looking at this in Verify and Mastercam, we saw that the runtime was sitting around 11 minutes and 24 seconds. And that was for both programs, when we were looking at tool change or uh, swivel prioritization. And when we actually ran them on the machine, we saw that those run times were more around 16 minutes and 45 seconds or 18 minutes and 49 seconds. So going from that virtual environment to the actual environment, we increased that runtime to five, in some cases, seven minutes. So I really hope that you enjoyed watching this video. I definitely spent a little bit more time looking at the finer details like high speed milling or organizing our toolpath operations so that we favored tool changes or swivel rotations. And I also wanted to run and record these programs on our machine so that we could look at the time studies together. So I hope that that benefited you as the viewer watching this and it's not just, you know, a virtual walkthrough. But I really appreciate you sticking through the whole video and watching the whole thing. And I'll go ahead and catch you in the next one. Thanks. Bye.